What's going on everybody? It's Mikhail Casanova coming at you with yet another banging video and the first banging video of 2018 from Mikhail Casanova, this brand and everything. So how's it going guys? I hope you guys are doing good. I know I have not been around for a while. I haven't been uploading videos uh, consistently. I've just, you know, I've been playing a game that's kind of just taken everything out of me to the point where I'm a little burnt out. Like, I, I just, it, it's, writing the review for this just took everything out of me. And, and now doing the video, that's taken a lot out of me. And so I just need some time to just, you know, dial everything back and work on, you know, projects I have at work, other projects I'm working on for the website, you know, the upcoming music album I'm going to drop pretty soon. And just a whole gaggle of things that I'm doing. I, I'm just... I've been so busy, and this has been the main game I played for a single month straight. And I'm finally able to bring to you guys a definitive review of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, because I've seen too many reviews of this game that are 10 minutes long or less. And it's almost like people didn't even actually play the game, and they're given a, a review what, 10 hours in, five hours in? I, I, sometimes I question the integrity of YouTubers and game reviewers. But that that's a topic for a podcast another time. I'm going to be reviewing Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and I'm going to tell you guys why this game is phenomenal, and I'm going to give an in-depth breakdown of everything that's worthwhile in this game. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. That way you stay up to date on all the latest, greatest content. And ding the bell so you get notified on everything that's going on every monthly because we're going to start in 2018. This month, we're going to be doing monthly giveaways of games. So if you want to be entered, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And let's go ahead and roll that intro music. The Xenoblade series has steadily grown into an RPG franchise great in the hearts of countless Japanese RPG fans. Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade Chronicles X pushed the limits of Nintendo's relatively underpowered platforms in unthinkable ways late in their life cycles. As a heads up before I go further into this review, let me tell you that this game is directly connected to both the original game, Xenoblade Chronicles, and what many assume to be a side game, which would be Xenoblade Chronicles X. And when in actuality it's not a side story, it's actually tied to the events of what is shown in both the ending of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2, as well as, if you want to pull it as a stretch, the beginning of Xenosaga, as well as Xenogears, uh, with the revelation of the Zohar, with the Conduit, you know, and more. All in all, this is all theory on my end. However, Tetsuya Takahashi has said before that all the references in this game are not to be just there for references sake, but also for longtime fans of the Xeno series altogether. Also, both Square Enix and Bandai Namco helped with this game. So owners, they're the owners of both the Xeno Gears and Xeno Saga games respectively. So that's another thing linking it all together. I can safely say that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has secured a spot in the highly exclusive club of elite titles, which doesn't only measure up to its cost, but it actually exceeds it. This sequel for the Switch, it, it just grabs a hold of you, and it rarely ever lets go. It consumes you just fully, just fully consumes you and it guides you through an enriching ride with its area of, of majestic environments, colorful visuals, and interesting and very lovable characters, and an overall compelling and captivating narrative. But beneath the glossy surface contains an elaborate, well-oiled machine of core gameplay elements as well. Xenoblade 2 is simply bursting at the seams with some feverishly addictive gameplay, intricate mechanics, and a bounty of content. 
There are a few unpolished bits here and there, and some strange quirks embedded within this large mechanism. But it produces such a level of greatness that these, in my opinion, minor flaws mostly fall by the wayside. The result is an enthralling JRP experience, and a Switch title that gives the likes of Zelda and Skyrim truly a run for its money. If you missed out on Xenoblade Chronicles, the first one, then worry not. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has a few winks and nods to it. Actually, more than you would assume. But it tells its own tale with an all new cast of characters that, at the end, ties, again, in my opinion, all of the Xeno series or the Xenoverse, which is the collective of every Xeno game that's been released from 1998 till now together and it leaves honestly more and more questions than it actually resolves and just it, it shows how deeply connected this whole thing is anyway rather than this the super sword willing shulk and friends returning from the first game we now take on the role of a more light-hearted and humble rex he's a scavenger of the massive cloud sea and soon to be driver Drivers are names given to fighters who wield the powers of mag magical life forms known as blades, taking the place of the iconic Monado sword from the Wii game. Blades take on an equally prominent role. Blades take on an equally prominent role. However, as they're essentially a juiced up immortal version of humans who hold various elemental powers at their disposal. They're sort of like Tolkien's elves meet Pokemon, ranging from weird-looking humanoids to wolf-like beasts, and apparently on occasional, you know, here and there, especially with the females, uh, and I guess for women, you might see some of the male characters as attractive, but, you know, occasionally, the women are very scantily clad and very attractive, which is funny, because there's, this is exciting, inciting so many SGWs and feminists to say that this game is very sexist and pulling towards childish sex appeal but the person who created who did all the artwork for this game or the majority of the artwork is actually <laughs> a, a, a female uh, anime right uh, drawer so it's kind of funny how that all works out anyway so these blades are scattered throughout the many lands of the world of all rest and are birthed from blue glowing core crystals this concept is certainly a cool gimmick that adds a distinct flavor to a genre that's been rife with familiar concepts and cliches. One which developer Monolith Soft does a fine job of playing with. Rex, along with a band of fellow drivers that he meets during his quest, finds a special blade named Pyra, a sought after Aegis, who we come to learn plays a very massive and major role in the story overall more so than her more modestly clothed blade brethren. The blades are the crux that both the narrative and the unique gameplay largely revolve around, joining the archives of Xenoblade lore along with the Titans. Players of the original Xenoblade may recall that Titans are gigantic godlike beasts whose bodies make up the landmass inhabited by all living things. Like the Blades, they are firmly interwoven into Xenoblade 2's mythos and play an integral role in the story. Rather than just two large titans comprising the lands of the first game, we now have a cluster of several smaller ones which you visit during the course of the journey. In fact, it's revealed that there have been an even greater number of titans centuries ago. But warfare, as well as the natural aging of the creatures, have created a lack of livable land and resources. This, in turn, begets even more fighting and political strife, and thus we're thrown into a web of major conflicts and drama that comprises the narrative of Xenoblade 2. There is a central place that these titans are encircling, and that is the World Tree. And on the World Tree is said to lie Elysium, home of the creative deity known only as the Architect. Though no one in recent memory has been able to get there to find out, in addition to the regular life forms, all rest, the world which is, this is all happening on, also hosts special artificial life known as blades, which is something I, I talked about earlier. 
So blades are attached to persons that are called drivers, the fighters that we spoke about, in a symbiotic relationship that augments abilities to create powerful fighters. Blades return to a core crystal when their driver dies, and when that happens, they have no memory of their previous life when they, re when they are revived by a new driver, creating an interesting dynamic between them and humanity. It may present itself as a light-hearted story at first, but Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is ultimately an adventure about growing up, about discovering the world around you, your place in it, who you are, your origins, the origins of everything around you. It's just a coming-of-age story, something that a lot of us can, in real life, relate to, minus all the fantasy parts. So, there are several darker and more mature themes that do begin to unfold the mysteries surrounding Rex and Pyra's trip. Now, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 excels at presenting multiple sides for the conflicts that prop up. There are many clever narrative tricks that brilliantly expose alternative perspectives on trickier situations. Characters often have a fairly compelling reason of why they do things the way they do, and I'm glad that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 takes the time to explore these in great length. As I was connecting the dots, there are many aspects in play here. We have notions and factions at odds with each other, blades at odds with humans, blades fighting other blades, you name it. During the journey, Rex and company find themselves in the thick of this instability, motivated by a desire to put an end to the whirlwind of conflict, protect the Aegis as well, and to find a more prosperous place to live. They venture to the legend called Elysium, which sits atop the world tree. But many of the various forces in play, each with their own motives and agendas, either want to control the area themselves or bar our heroes from reaching it. An astonishing feat of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is its firm commitment to flesh out the denizens of Allrest. As I made my way to new locales on each Titan, I began to learn about how and why people lived at each of them. I learned how each nation's political body functions and how they've adapted to the land conditions on their corresponding titan. It's an insane attention to detail. It's all quite mythological, even biblical in nature, as we're guided through an origin story that continues to escalate further in scale and significance until it all reaches a satisfying crescendo. Yasunori Masuda's musical direction is excellent, and it's supported by a small selection of other composers devoted to the field and combat tracks. A wonderful selection of battle themes complement the action very, very nicely, while others bring further emotion and atmosphere to key cutscenes and sweeping hauntingly beautiful and distinct themes for the various settlements and fields further add to their character. The score is full of hugely pleasurable tracks to listen to across the board, just like in the first Xenoblade Chronicles. This game, the English voice cast does a tremendous job selling the characters. We have English voices, Scottish voices, Welsh accents. It's just so, it, it's amazing. It's a wealth of varied accents, which make it one of the more uniquely sounding RPGs once again. Not every, you know, not every delivery is perfect, but I was quite satisfied with the performances overall, especially given the scope of how many voice scenes are in the game. The frequent inadequate lip sync to the English script, however, is one of the more noticeable flaws. Entire lines missing their mark when a character speaks is a common ongoing problem throughout Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The game's Japanese voices are available on the Nintendo eShop for free if you'd rather go that route. Just make sure you have enough uh, storage on your Switch or your micro SD card to be able to download and install that. Of course, the marquee feature that defines the Xenoblade game is its world and level design. Exploring Xenoblade Chronicles 2 both on my TV and on the go has been a remarkable experience. It's a return to form from Xenoblade Chronicles 1, which means expect heavily populated towns, villages, fields, and much more. From rocky deserts to snowy mountains, it is a very vivid and marvelous thing to gaze at. 
Xenoblade Chronicles 2 may not be the most graphically intensive game on the Switch, but man, its scope and art design are as beautiful as ever. The final stretches of the game are breathtaking to behold. Most areas seamlessly flow into one another, and the only time you'll be seeing a loading screen is when you're booting up a save, fast traveling, or transitioning into a cutscene. It's not one huge, consistent open world like Xenoblade Chronicles X, but it sure can feel like it at times. And loading times are only a few seconds long, to be honest. Though it comes at a cost. See, fast traveling between areas often makes it load into incomplete environments, so textures and assets will be missing more often than not, so it could look really ugly for a second or two before it finally gets done loading everything in. The party AI that follows you around has a nasty habit of warping around you as the game panics to logically relocate them by you. This is most noticeable when you're traversing at uneven elevations. Several technical limitations keep Xenoblade Chronicles 2 from being a smooth experience overall. However, it does do a decent job maintaining 30 frames per second most of the time. However, certain situations will make it start sweating. Bigger towns cause it to slow down as it was loading in bigger buildings and denser crowds of NPCs. Busier battles with lots of enemies and flashy skill effects popping off and once will cause it to chug at times, and there were even a few instances in which the game audio would cut in and out. You know, all that being said though, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is an impressive game no doubt. I just do wonder if, you know, a few more months in development would have done it some good to iron out these kinks. But you know, have, hopefully a patch can resolve some of these glaring issues. Now, handheld mode on Xenoblade Chronicles 2 does hold up very well for the most part. And, you know, admittedly there is a noticeable resolution drop, but the Switch's small screen size helps keep the environments largely crisp. Portable players will want to have battery banks or battery cases for the Switch handy for play sessions. Because, in my experience, a full charge Switch will drop to low battery level level within just about two and a half hours. For me, after a fair mix of battles, exploration, story cutscenes, fast traveling, you name it. Nevertheless, roaming around Xenoblade Chronicles 2 environments still feels as great as it did in the other Xenoblade entries. High viewpoints give you a brief moment to survey the land before diving in, and the overwhelming sense of wonder and curiosity about each new area I encountered, it just it never failed to cease. Everywhere you run in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is like a new story waiting just to be told. Foes of all levels lurk in every inch in true Xenoblade fashion, which means prepare to run like hell from that very high level 114 enemy that sees you and is not going to let you go. Monolith Soft has done a superb job of revamping the mechanics of combat to make for a complex yet user-friendly experience. While retaining subtle elements that worked well from prior entries, there's a plethora of attacks and strategies you can utilize rather than mindlessly sitting back hacking away with auto attacks. The game impressively manages to cram even more intricacies into the system this time around, while also tweaking the interface to be easier and more efficient to use. And rather than scrolling through a list of potential moves like you would in Xenoblade Chronicles 1 or in Xenoblade Chronicles X, you're now given blade attacks which are directly mapped to the Switch's face buttons. So you can carry up to three blades and swap them out on the fly by mapping them to the directional buttons or the D-pad. The interface is very manageable and clearly displayed despite all the factors involved. And you know what? I was able to grasp at least the basics pretty easily. There are, however, several layers of more complex details and strategies that dedicated players can play around with to gain the upper hand, and which you'll need to at least moderately understand when delving into later chapters. I'm going to include in this section a video from a good friend of mine and fellow YouTuber, Andres Restart, which explains in detail how to understand the battle system for this game. So, while you're watching this, Go ahead and give him a subscribe, ding the notification bell on his channel, and also follow him on Twitter.
Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has a very deep and engaging battle system. I've been able to do some really crazy intense combos where it's gone well over a million damage. It's pretty cool. But the thing is, I wasn't able to do that until I actually understood the battle system. And the game doesn't really do a good job of explaining anything much beyond the basics. There's not even a typing chart. Not Unless you pay attention to really subtle clues, There there is no clear typing chart in the game. So I had to go ahead and do research and experimentation before I actually figured it out. So I'm going to go ahead and explain that to, to you guys, as well as blade combos and chain attacks. So first, let's go over the actual elemental typing and weakness chart thing. We have eight types, and no, it does not work anything like Pokemon. So let me go ahead and show you the actual chart here. I made it for myself so you can understand how it works. Fire beats water, water beats fire, wind beats ice, ice beats wind, lightning beats earth, earth beats lightning, light beats dark, dark beats light. It's actually pretty simple once you see the chart, you, you get it. It's really that, that's it, it's really that simple. So when you're in a chain attack and you see the different orbs available to bust, what you have to do is you use the opposite type. So if there's a fire orb, you break it with a water attack. If there's a wind orb, you break it with an ice attack and so on. And by breaking the orbs, you'll be able to extend your chain attack and thus increase the amount of damage you can do. So now let's go over blade combos, because you need to do blade combos to get into chain attacks with the orbs. So basically how it works is that you have to use your specials. Your specials are delegated to the A button, and you have four tiers of them. When you use a tiered special, just tier one, that will initiate the blade combo. For the record, you don't need a tier four special at all, but that does do a little bit more damage. But it doesn't matter. So once you start with once you start up the blade combo with any sort of typing, you will then see a tree in the top right, and that will indicate the path you can go. So if you use a fire attack, it might ask you to do a water or another fire attack, and that will lead to the third potential final combo, which will have a, is some sort of buff or immunity that you may want to help to do to help you without the battle. It's also important to note that the blade combos do an insane amount of damage, and you want to do them. You don't even need to do them for the chain attacks. Then them, the blade combos themselves do crazy amounts of damage, but they also provide orbs. Depending on the typing of the final attack of the blade combo, that will be the kind of orb that starts orbiting around the enemy. And you want to try to get as many different kinds of orbs or flying around the enemy. You cannot get two of the same orb. That's not how it works. But you can get fire, water, wind, and ice all in one if you want, or I've never gone beyond four, so I don't know if it can go beyond four, but if you can, let me know, that'd be crazy. So anyways, once you have many orbs flying around the enemy, you want to jump into a chain attack. You don't really need many orbs, but the more orbs, the better. So once you're in the chain attack, as I explained before, you want to use the opposite typing to break an orb. It won't break on the first attack, but it will bust it, and once it's busted, the next attack that is not going to break another orb will smash that one. As long as you're using the opposite types for each orb you see, you will be able to break all the orbs and extend your combos to a crazy amount. So if you see two different orbs there, fire and ice, for example, you use a water attack, it will then crack the fire orb, and then maybe on your next move you use a wind attack to crack the, the ice orb on your third attack whatever typing you use it will smash the fire orb then you will go into your second round and whatever attack you use will finally smash the ice orb and that will open up a third round to do even more damage and that's basically how it works by extending your combos at, by having more and more orbs around you you will you know you get more turns more damage in, and it multiplies the multiple the multiplier expands every round you go so it can add up it goes up exponentially and by doing that, you can eventually get to some really high amounts of damage, and this is the best way to really beat bosses. But here's another pro tip. Well, I'm not sure if I'm even a pro, but just some my own personal experience. When you go into a chain attack, and this the enemy is pretty good at killing you, you want to make sure that you kill him before the chain attack is over, because when you end the chain attack, you will your meter will be at zero, and you won't be able to revive yourself or your teammates and that would suck. So when you go into a chain attack, be prepared to end the fight. So basically, make sure you either have a lot of orbs or the enemies are already around under half-life or a third life. You'll, you'll figure it out as you go. But that's basically how it works, guys. Yeah, we're gonna be going over how to do specials and build them up, and we're also gonna be going over how to navigate through the blade combo tree. 
So last week I actually made a video about understanding chain attacks, elemental orbs, how to break them, and understanding the type chart and which element beats what. So if you're curious about all of that, check that video, the link will be in the description below. But anyways, in that video, a lot of you guys give me some really nice comments and I really appreciate it. But also some of you asked me how to navigate the Blade Combo Tree and how to do specials. So I am explaining that in this video now. So before we go into how to build up your specials, how to navigate the Blade Combo Tree, we should first actually understand what a Blade Combo is. So, a Blade Combo is basically a succession of three specials between you and your teammates that will lead to a certain buff, creating a big old explosion with lots of damage and creating an orb that will fly around your enemy. And you want to build up as many different elemental orbs as possible so you can deal lots of damage during a chain attack. That's how you can deal like well over a million damage by building up the different orbs and breaking all of them. So let's kind of go into how do you build up your specials and na then navigate a blade combo, right? So a blade combo is initiated when you start a special, and your specials are those A buttons uh, moves that you can press. So whenever you see those Roman numerals, you know, 1 through 4, I, 2I, 3I, IV, those are your specials and they build up throughout time. You only need a tier 1 special to start a blade combo. So whatever you do, it will work. So for example, I may press fire. You use a fire special. I press A and that will initiate the blade combo and you will see the blade combo tree set up in the top right. And in order to go down that blade combo tree, what I need to do is then use the next blade combo that's on the map. So for example, in the example I'm going to be showing, right, I will start with fire and there will be an option to do fire or water. You'll see the fire symbol highlighted. That's where I'm at. I can either go for a water special or a fire special and then after that I have the option of going fire or light if I pick fire but if I pick water I can go for fire or ice and notice how each one at the end has a certain debuff and whatever I end up doing at the end with my third and final special that will be the debuff I get and the color of orb I get flying around the enemy. Remember you want to get as many different colored orbs flying around the enemy as possible. So that's how it works but in order to go down the blade combo tree you need to do three whole specials and that may require to you being able to build up specials pretty pretty well right so now we're going to go over how to actually build up your specials so basically what you need to do to build up your specials is get those blue circles to sort of expand and you get a blue circle to expand whenever you press an art a special or a blade right when you land an attack it doesn't matter if it's an auto attack or an art or whatever just right when you land an attack and you finish an attack off a combo that will the blue orb will expand and that's telling the game is telling you that you're building up your special and you will see a red line build up around that roman numeral in the bottom right that's when you know you're doing it correctly so one thing i really like to do is i use my auto attack to build up my arts when I, all my arts are available to use when i do that once i do that right it's really cool because on the third and final auto attack which deals the most damage but also will give me the most special meter rays on the third and final one i will press an art so I'll press, let's say for example, X right at the end of the third auto attack. There's a bit of a window here, so if you do it right after or right at the same time, it'll probably still work. And then, once I'm at the final hit of that art, of my the art I just pressed, I will press the next art. And I'll see a blue circle appear again, and at the end of the final attack of that second art, I will then press my third art, and I'll see a blue circle arise again. And from this point, I can decide to either A, press a special right on my final hit to get the blue circle to appear again and grow the special even more, or B, I could go into a blade right at the same time as I launch that final attack, which will also build up my special. And what's interesting though, is that you can really link this up, so you can go from, from final auto attack to art, to another art, to another art, to a blade, and then the, all their arts will be available, and then you can do their arts in succession in a chain attack, and then go to another blade, and then circle all the way back, and then do an awesome special. You could do this theoretically, but most of the time you won't need to do that many, do it that many times to build up your special. If you, if you just do the arts in a row, like I just said, you'll build up your special pretty quickly. So that's how you build up your special, basically. There's a few other things you may want to know to give yourself an advantage to actually get the blade combos done, because the thing is, when you launch a special, you will see a meter at the top right of the enemy. So for example, when I launch a fire special, I will see a fire meter, and that's slowly going down. That is the timer that I, I am given that is telling me how much time I have before I can initiate the next special and the blade combo tree. And like, for, for example, with the example I'm using, when I launch a fire special, I can either go into a fire or water special after that. So I have to build up a fire or water special either between my allies or myself before I run out of time. 
So one, by being able to build specials quickly, it makes that a lot easier. But also, what you a few other things you could do to make it easier is by either a using break or topple, and then launching and smashing. That will reset the timer and give you more time to build up your special so you can continue the blade combo because if the meter runs out you will have to start all over. Another thing you could do is just be kind of strategic as you as you go about doing your special. So for example, you what you could do is that you launch a special right at tier 1, you don't waste that much of your special meter. And then you know your allies could then do their next special. But the moment you see ZL or ZR, do not press them immediately. Instead, how about you wait until the meter is almost at the end and then press ZL or ZR. That way you're giving yourself enough time to build up another special or your other ally enough time to build another special. So that way you will be able to launch the third and final special right after the second one. That way you can make sure you actually get the blade combo down. By doing this, you're being strategic as you, uh, throughout the entire process, and it's a lot more likely that you'll finish off a blade combo. So between building, but between linking up all your arts and, and blade switches, and getting those blue circles, and using break and topple, and being strategic as, you, as to how you go about launching each special, the timing of it, you should be able to build up your specials in time to go throughout an entire blade combo, which is three specials in a row. So as I've been explaining, like the, with the example I'm using, it could be throughout with any type, right? But you'll, yeah, I'll, I'll press fire, and then we'll see two different elements, right to the right, one slightly above, one slightly below, in the blade combo tree in the top right. I'll pick one, and that will lead to two more at the end, and I can either pick whichever one I want to get the sort of element I want and a certain debuff. And you can see all of that laid out from the ver from right when you laid out your first special, so you can uh, have an idea of where you want to go. So hopefully, I was able to explain all of that pretty well. If I didn't, let me know in the comments below so I can help you guys out even more. But anyways guys, that's pretty much it. I hope that helped out and I hope you guys enjoy the video and I'll see you all really soon. Acquiring new blades involves opening core crystals. There are a few rewarded from specific side quests and these crystals are essentially loot boxes. You cannot purchase them with real money at all. They are only obtainable in-game and have common, rare, and even legendary variants to them. Blades are both weapons and actual living beings. Pyra is Rex's blade and wields the Aegis Sword. Blades can only be used by the driver that opens them. If Rex obtains a blade, he can't normally transfer it to Nia. The only way to transfer a blade to another driver is through the rare overdrive protocol item. As you might expect, there are a handful of extremely special rare blades that can be rolled in crystals. They can show up in commons, rares, and legendaries, but so can generic common blades too. Yes, even in the small amount of legendary crystals you're given, opening crystals steadily becomes an arduous process. And it's exciting at first to see, and then you start amassing a lot of crystals, and the next thing you know, you'll be spending long stretches of time using them one by one. Or getting rid of them to uh, get boosters. There's no way to open them in a batch, and there's no way to skip the animation of opening them. As, as soon as you select a crystal to open, the game will save right away to prevent save scumming and cycle through the three blade silhouettes in that crystal. You'll always obtain the third one and you can bet you'll be tantalized with those rare blade silhouettes that you've just missed. The menu screen for your characters and various aspects of the game such as the upgrades and customizations that come with it are similarly complex and convoluted enough to make your head spin at first glance. This aspect of the game proved a bit more cumbersome for me at first. However, you'll eventually get the grasp of it. There seem to be a thousand ways to customize and beef up both your character and accompanying blades, but I'll touch on those key aspects. You can upgrade weapons both with enhancements called chips and by earning weapon points which are earned in combat to upgrade your blade arts. There is also the more subtle and intricate means of improving blades known as Affinity. Drawing from another familiar Xenoblade staple, Affinity works as a sort of achievement system which grants a number of advantages to blades once the specified requirements are met. Drivers are given a more simplified web statistic nodes, which can be unlocked by using skill points accumulated in battle. In a more distinctive Xenoblade 2 feature, Equipable armor is thrown out of the window. 
at least in the traditional sense, as the as it comes only in the form of diverse palette or interchangeable accessories. Each accessory contains a number of various statistical boosts or perks, and only a limited number can be equipped. In theory, at least you'll want to assign them according to a fighter's role in battle. For instance, tanks will be best served with HP boosts, whereas healers will want items that maximize their magic or either, as well as healing abilities. Blades come with their own equivalent of this known as Ox Cores, which annoyingly can't be used until they're refined using various materials gathered from collectible points throughout all rest. Enemies sometimes roam the vast landscapes in large quantities which can lead to trouble as they're often quite sensitive when it comes to aggro. You know, on one level, this unwanted attention makes sense as it can certainly keep things exciting. Yet, I often found myself helplessly fleeing from a band of swift, high-level wolves or a massive, super-powered hawk looming overhead or a major T-Rex or, you know, a, a basically a gear or a, 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 a skill. I, I'm gonna say skill because that's what was in Xenoblade Chronicles X. Which would quickly make mincemeat of me before I could escape. It's also quite easy to draw in wandering baddies nearby once you've engaged an opponent, even when stationary, making it moderately difficult battle, nearly futile in a hurry. Still, checkpoints are frequent, fast travel is readily available, and saves our breeze, which at least limits the frustration factor when dying. I've said a whole lot, but I've yet to touch on Titans, and here's the thing. Titans, they were a joy to explore for the most part. Particularly as I delved deeper into the game, I felt a childlike giddiness as I sailed across the vast cloud sea, not knowing what sort of exotic lands and accompanying colonies awaited, although they are all intertwined within the larger story in one way or another. Each titan felt like a self-contained world, often crawling with distinct creatures and societies, as well as unique and gorgeous environments. Amongst them are an exotic chain of islands that Rex calls home, a massive chasm of colorful foliage and jagged terrain and a dusty industrial titan accompanied by the Empire, and these are just but a, a handful of locations you'll pass through. Subtle details like swing grass and day-night transitions further add to the rich atmosphere and make the land seem more organic. Which is fitting, as they're technically, they are organic. While I'll always have fond memories trekking across Bionis and Mekonis, I welcome Xenoblade 2's departure from the original game's Titan duopoly in favor of this collage of smaller, diverse titans. They're more modest size allow the game to, to walk the line between open world and linear, which makes an experience that isn't overwhelming and keeps things focused. Cities are rife with bustling activity and plenty of chatty townsfolk, rows of shops, as well as side quests, which are thankfully easier to locate with the addition of indicators hovering over NPCs. The tasks town people dish out often result to Less than exciting fetch quests and money, monster hunting, but they're a decent way to take a break from the main story as well as gain XP and collectibles in a different way. <laughs> Cities even impressively come with individual economies as you can level up a town when buying and or selling enough items, which eventually lowers the prices. Another sort of peripheral task you can undertake is to send off some blades on mercenary missions to boost their affinity and bring in even more riches. Does it add a ton to the game? Not exactly. Though it's a clever way to make use of some of the excess troops that you have, which you know will no doubt begin to pile up as you progress and you collect more blade cores. Graphically, the game proves to be stellar throughout, especially when playing in dock mode, and contains an artistic depth that blends Japanese color and charm with hints of grittiness and detail find in Western RPGs. Impressive draw distances and, and vibrant, crisp aesthetics help paint the landscape and immerse you in the enchanting, diverse world of Allrest. 
There's a wonderful blend of artistic freedom in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The main cast and antagonists have different artists, numerous Japanese guest artists were also brought on board for each of the Rare Blades too. Their portrait illustrations hugely contrast from one another, but Xenoblade Chronicles 2's graphical engine does a fascinating job just consolidating their designs to be more consistent with each other. Sometimes, you know, cutscenes do highlight the minor glaring issues of character models clipping into their outfits. But the best thing to come from Monolith Salt's decision with Xenoblade Chronicle 2's art direction is their expressiveness in cutscenes. They finally found a style that allows them to tastefully convey facial animations and expressions in body language without being hindered by underpowered hardware or a confused, you know, semi-realistic palette of graphics. Characters are able to show that they're full of life and the cutscenes take full advantage of it. Playing on the Switch's small screen does diminish this somewhat as the visuals devolve to a slightly muddled look more reminiscent of the original Xenoblade, but th even with that being said, they're still quite impressive for a hybrid console and handheld mode. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is an extraordinary game. It just it stays true to the ideal classic RPG experience. Monolith Soft has meticulously crafted a typical boy meets girl and save the world story into an endearing tale that feels fresh. The amount of thought and work put into the world of All Rest is just truly jaw dropping. It's masterfully put together with incredible cutscenes and charming. It's just a really charming cast characters is a very thrilling battle system and an exceptional soundtrack. Those who prefer their games brimming with content, you don't need to worry as this game is a gargantuan single player experience that can be as addictive and time consuming as you let it be. Completion of the main story brought me near the 80 hour mark and beyond and that was when breezing through or bypassing a large portion of the side quests entirely. There are still additional blades I've yet to unearth, powerful and unique monsters left undefeated and areas left under or unexplored, and I look forward to going back. 2017 has brought us a great deal of superb RPGs, and in general gaming experiences overall, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 magnificently stands tall among them to close the year out with a bang. This is most definitely Casanova. So please, buy this amazing game. And that just about wraps up the review of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, the definitive review of this game. And I, I really want to thank Monolith Soft and Nintendo. I even want to thank Square Enix and Namco for just giving us such an amazing game. You know, just everybody coming together to work together to make such an amazing game, which I like. I'm not going to be one of the people that's complaining about the anime style because if you're truly a Zeno fan, then the anime, anime style is nothing new because the original Zeno Gears had an anime aesthetic. So did Zeno Saga, Zeno Blade Chronicles X, even though the original Zeno Blade Chronicles didn't. But I don't understand the hate towards anime. I mean, if you don't like it, that's fine to not like it, but to hate it and all these Weibo references, I don't even know what the fuck Weibo means, but you know, people really crapping on things that they don't like is just weird to me. So if you don't like it, it's fine to say you don't like it and just leave it alone and go from there. But you know, nature people, social media people like to say things. So. That being said, thank you guys for watching. Amazing game. Really loved it. Thank you, Nintendo. And thank you to everybody that has, you know, been supporting the channel for the last year and a half, a well, year and a few months that we've been around. I really want to thank you guys for that. I want to thank you guys for being part of when, you know, I launched the Casanova podcast, which is available on iTunes and Google Play, as well as on Shout Engine, SoundCloud, as well as Podbean. And yeah, I'm just, it's just, it's so amazing. It's so amazing that I've been able to branch out into other avenues and trajectories and all kinds of things. And I want to thank you guys as a fan. So that being said, thank all of you. And I will catch y'all in the next one. Deuces wow, too sweet, be the elite.
cease and desist any foolery, and I'll catch you on the next one. Deuces. Girl, you demand all the attention Starry eyed, maybe I need a new prescription I, I, I see you on top of me, I'm having visions While you spin it around, I'm getting dizzy, baby Drop and roll, hot